watch your little world falling apart There's guns for hire Even if we're just dancing in the dark If I couldn't be a musician tomorrow and I had to find something else to do, I have no idea what I'd do. One of the greatest live performers in the history of rock and roll. The boss, Mr. Americana, champion of the everyman, Bruce Springsteen. Music was really my first uh, refuge against things that were bothering me, so it did help a lot. You're young and you don't understand the different things you're feeling. Uh, you certainly don't understand if there's any chemical imbalance in your makeup. Mm -hmm. So all I knew was when I played, it deeply centered me and chased away my blues. I think that's how it all started. Let me find it there. Okay. All right. I have a uh, favorite place I go. I go to it was a favorite spot that my pop used to go to. It was a place called the Manasquan Inlet, and. Um, it's the just a place, Shore. yeah, it's just yeah. a place where the boats come in and the boats go out it's by the beach, lovely set of rocks. So this is me traveling home from a short visit at the Manasquan Inlet. I travel into a stream of headlights as commuter cars holding their day travelers flash by inches from my left handle grip. I move north up the highway until the traffic recedes leaving only my headlight illuminating blank road and dashes of white line, white line, white line, white line. My ape hanger, high-rise handlebars, thrust my arms out in skyward shoulder height, opening me up to the wind's full force. It's a rough embrace. As my gloved hands tighten their grip on that new evening sky, the cosmos begins to flicker to life in the twilight above me with no fairing, a 60 mile per hour gale steadily pounds into my chest, nudging me to the back of my seat, subtly threatening to blow me off 600 pounds of speeding steel, reminding me of how the next moment holds no guarantees and of how good things are. This day, this life, how lucky I've been, how lucky I am. I turn the corner off the highway onto a dark country road. I hit my high beams, I scan the flat farm fields looking for deer, all clear. I twist the throttle as rushing into my arms comes home. On a rattlesnake speedway in the Utah desert, I pick up my money. You know, America is a place that still has an enormous amount of wonderful qualities about it. You know, I mean, I just love the country itself. I, I always have. I think that I've had a critical but creative voice is, is the voice I search for in my music, whether it was born in the USA. I think the thing that was about that song was it had a critical verse, critical voice in the verses. And yet there was a sense of pride in, in birthplace in the choruses. And that's where I've always come from. You know, I've, I've you know, I've, I've grew up in America and my music is thoroughly American. And uh, while I certainly have an, a lot of criticisms about where we live, it's something I've also always been, uh, I've always had a lot of pride in, so. All my years on the road. 
Chasing hell, drinking devil's blood. Born in New Jersey in 1949, Bruce Springsteen spent his early years on South Street in Freehold Borough. His dad, Douglas, was a bus driver of Dutch-Irish ancestry, and his mother, Adele Zarilli, a legal PA of Italian parentage. Growing up as something of a shy and gauche loner, his love of music shone through from an early age. He was seven when he first saw Elvis Presley on The Ed Sullivan Show. Well, that's what I, I think that's how it all started. <laughs> you know, you're young and you don't understand the different things you're feeling. Uh, you certainly don't understand if there's any chemical imbalance in your makeup. Mm -hmm. So all I knew was when I played, it deeply centered me and chased away my blues, you know, for whatever the reason was. Um, I think it was, it, there was an enormous amount of self-realization in playing. And when you w walked off the stage at night, you knew who you were, you know, and you felt you've done something constructive. So you left with a certain feeling of lightness and a certain positivity that eluded me in a lot of the rest of my daily life. Mm -hmm. So music was really my first uh, refuge against things that were bothering me. So it did help a lot. In 1965, Bruce started playing as a jobbing musician along the Jersey Shore. It was during this period that he was dubbed the boss. If your father, with whom you had a very troubled relationship, was alive today, mm -hmm. do you think he would be tempted to vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> if he voted at all, you know? <laughs> I'm not sure, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he'd have a hard time. He'd, be, he'd have a hard time. He was an angry man, though, wasn't he? <laughs> he was an angry, depressed um, man. He'd... Uh, he had, you know, I think if you just, if you just look towards my music and you hear the way I, I, I created a bit of an archetype in my songs about him, and it was a little bit of a one-dimensional, one, one-dimensional one portraiture. He had a, he had a lot of different qualities beyond the fact that he struggled, you know, with, with his, with his life and his, and working, you know, so he, he was a much more complicated character than that. What about your mother? Would she be in love with Hillary Clinton as a candidate? That's a good question. I'm not sure. You know, my mother, who when I was very young, I know was very democratic. Um, she was the first one to say, you know, who are we, mom? We're Democrats. Why? Mm -hmm. They're for the working people. Uh, that was the only political discussion we had in my house when I was a kid. But, um, uh, she was also, she, she tended to get a little more conservative as she got older, but uh, she wouldn't be a Trump voter. It's obvious that his life was a bit of a struggle at the start, and his, his mum bought him a very cheap guitar, but had to save for it. I think it was an $18 guitar. A few years later, she took out a loan for another guitar, a much better guitar for $60. So years later, he paid her tribute in the song The Wish, which starts off with him and his mum looking in the music shop window and then him getting the Japanese guitar beneath the Christmas tree and talks about dancing around the living room with, it, with his mum. So it was, a, it was a lovely tribute to his mum. It became readily apparent like, that he had a really prodigious gift and, and talent and skill and you know, was playing in talent shows and forming bands locally in, in New Jersey. He was a bit of a loner. He didn't bother going to his own high school graduation. And of course this new music is happening all around him. You know, rock music is giving him his... He's giving him clues about how he can piece together his identity, if you like. As far as when I became really conscious of seeking out music as a way to search for identity, that was early rock records, um, you know, probably the early Elvis records, early surf records, some, some of the doo-wop records from the late 50s and 60s. That was when you were, those are the, those are the years when you're in your late teens or, or actually early, early teens where, you know, you're trying to figure out who you are. And I think 
kids turn to popular culture for for initially a, a starting place. I like the way that guy dresses, or I like the way the feeling this music evokes, or that's cool. So th those are the earliest records that that I think that I experienced as a search for for identity, which I really kind of carried through all of my music to this day. You know, he ended up becoming lead singer of a band called the Castiles, and. And it's interesting because there's like this whole psychedelic revolution kind of going on in 1965, 1966, and Bruce Springsteen's kind of untouched from that. When Bruce was only 18, he was called up to the draft in the Vietnam War. A committed pacifist, it was a cause he did not believe in, but he failed his physical anyway following a motorcycle accident a few months earlier. Bruce was now free to pursue his music career, playing in dingy dives at smoky bars along the East Coast. He was determined to make it big. And it wasn't long before he became the greatest exponent of what was soon to become the famous Jersey Shore Sound. By now, he had carefully cherry-picked the band that would back and support him for nearly 40 years, minus one very important character. The story about when he first met him, he came into a club and, and, and the wind was howling so much that when Clarence opened the door, the hinges fell off and Clarence enters. You know, it's, it's wonderful mythology, you know. It's, it's love, you know. It's, it's, it's more than being married. It's more than being male, female. It's two men, two men, two strong, very virile men finding that space in life where they can, can, can let go enough of their masculinity to, to feel the passion of love, you know, and respect. And that's what it is. It's love, respect, and trust. You know, three qualities that every marriage should have, you know, that's, and it's based on that. You know, friendships are based on those things and you seal it with a kiss. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. I think that Bruce trying to articulate the sounds in his head requires trusted musicians who know his shorthand, know his lingo, and I think that's what the E Street Band really do for him. One of the things I always say I'm the proudest of is that uh, friendship survived, and, and uh, those are the things that were really important. And, and it, right now, it's just it's just nothing but a, a ride. You know, it's great. Finding Clarence was like gold dust for Bruce. The chemistry between the two men became legendary, and their friendship was to spill over onto the stage, much to the delight of their fans. The E Street Band family was now complete. In his early career in particular, a lot of people thought that he wrote like Dylan, and he also wrote like Van Morrison and sounded like Van Morrison. And I can understand a little in terms of there's a certain blue-eyed soul, there's a certain garage rock, there's a, a, a real masculinity to his music. The early, the early Bruce Springsteen stuff like definitely has a lineage to Bob Dylan. Obviously, he was obsessed with Woody Guthrie, and Bob Dylan was obsessed with Woody Guthrie. Music critics are they're a very jaded species, and if somebody sounds like somebody, then they're like they're instantly dismissive because they're like, well, why do I need to listen to this person if another person like this exists? It wasn't long before Bruce discovered how cruel and demanding the music industry could be. The music that I love the most, I go back to, if I think about the 40s, I think of Frank Sinatra. If I think of the 60s, I think of probably Dylan and, you know, the Stones and the Beatles. If you think of the 70s, I probably think of the Sex Pistols and the Clash and, and uh, you know, I think the early 90s, I, I think Nirvana and a lot of the new rock bands did that. So I think it's something where where uh, that was music, music that was evocative of a particular time and a particular place. You put on Hank Williams and you see that American countryside in the 40s, the minute his voice and the geography of the land are intertwined, you know, it's, it's inextricable from one another, you know? Frank Sinatra, New York City, what people imagine New York City in the 30s and 40s, that's, 
intertwined forever, you know. And I think I always wanted my music to, to summon up a certain time and a certain place and a certain inner geography. Bruce began working on his music with a ferocity and energy that would ultimately totally confound his critics. With John Hammond's guidance, he set about recording his debut album. For its title, he stayed true to his roots, naming it Greetings from Asbury Park, a place in Jersey which held many happy memories for him. It's interesting because you have Bruce Springsteen coming out 72, 73 on the East Coast in New Jersey, and then you have this parallel you know, Los Angeles singer-songwriter movement. And they were kind of doing schmaltzy or more saccharine kind of things. And you have somebody like Bruce Springsteen. He's not sitting there and kind of enjoying the LA sunshine and kind of smoking weed by pools. He's in these like kind of gritty bars and like, you know, he's, he's around these people. He's getting real experiences. If you think about it, just the title, Greetings from Asbury Park, like he is rooted in such a sense of place that's undeniable. And I think he understood that early on. It has this audacity to say, I'm here and I'm from New Jersey. It's not New York hipster. It's not LA folky. It's not this kind of Dylan traveling hobo thing. It's Jersey. I always thought I was writing American music in the sense that that was where I came from. But on the other hand, my biggest audience certainly for the past 10 years has been in continental Europe, you know, where we've had deep, deep support from our fans over there. I watched your concert the other day, four hours and 10 minutes, I think I told you. Um, how do you do it? I always have a trouble stopping, so it's not really... It's the opposite. You know, it's not really... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the night has an organic life of its own, you know. The, if I come out at night not quite knowing exactly where, the audience is going to take me or where I'm going to go. And I want people to go home feeling like they've had a night that they're going to, that's going to resonate within them. That's going to, hopefully, uh, we go out to entertain, we go out to inspire, uh, we go out to stir you to action. Um, so there's a lot at stake, I feel, when I go out on stage at night. I, I like that. I like playing for those stakes I always have since I was a young man. And that's, that's the way I go about it. This is it. Hi, Ma. This is Bruce. Bruce. I'll, I'll be honest with you, really, OK? I have to hand it to Bruce Springsteen. I don't think that it's just uh, him, in particular, being an artist that has made this whole fascination uh, uh, totally, you know, just everybody go crazy. And he has, uh, I think it's his personality that has done it. He has uh, coupled uh, his, um, uh, oh boy, he's made everybody love him more than they love Jesus, okay, basically. No, I'm serious. I mean, he has sold more records than anybody has ever sold, as far as I, I can see, you know, and sold out more concerts, and everybody wants him, and everybody wants to touch him, and, you know, but he has to be doing something right, and that is he's basically a nice person. What do you expect to see that you can't see from anybody else? Real sweat. The one guy. Real sweat. The Real one sweat. guy who puts it all on the line. More He's work. Everything. More work. Everything. I'd crawl 3,000 miles on crushed glass to see Bruce <laughs> perform. Bonsoir, Perry.
I would say he has this extraordinary ability to, to take a giant room, a stadium, and reduce it to the size of a small room. I, I remember seeing him, you know, before I actually saw him live, when, when I was a teenager, I saw him on a TV, and I, th I think it was about 1978, and it was at a concert in London, and I just thought, wow. And you could see the happiness on his face. You know, that's where, that's where he belonged. However many shows he wants to play, on the East Coast especially, you know, if he wants to book 10 shows in 10 football stadiums across the Eastern Seaboard, he's going to sell out 10 shows. I love coming across him live. You know, I'll go out of my way to see him live. You know, I'll beg Bo and steal a ticket to see him live. Because that, to me, is the essence of, of, of who he really is. And he knows exactly how to structure what could, you know, a two-hour set. It never flags. And he will always he will always play a song you're desperate, desperate to hear. And his energy is just un unfailing. It's, it's remarkable. He makes an effort to come to every single part of the stage, responds to the crowd. So that barrier that now exists these days in, in modern stadium concerts between between the, the front of the, the crowd and the stage evaporates. I had a friend who was really into him and he went to play at a football stadium called St James's Park in Newcastle and the, the friend said look this guy's on stage for so long we may have to break away and have a meal during the concert. So I, I bought this idea that Springsteen plays for four hours, we go for an hour, we go and have a meal in a restaurant, we come back for the last hour. Of course it wasn't quite like that. We went into this massive crowd, tens of thousands of people, we got near the front as you do, you push through when you're in your teens and we were just locked in position for the full set which must have been two and a half, three hours, and I can remember almost every song, and and it was it was incredible. He is an incredible performer because his his songs are built for stadiums. By 1974, the Jersey Shore sound was really making waves in the rock world, and Rolling Stone magazine decided to send one of its top writers along to discover what all the excitement was about. What happened next was quite extraordinary. Around the time of E Street Shuffle, he encountered for the first time John Landau, and he was to become a, a really key figure in his, in his life, in his career. And Landau wrote, after seeing Bruce, that he had seen the future of rock and roll, and his name was Bruce Springsteen. And he said, um, on a night that he needed to feel young, he, Bruce had made him feel that he was hearing music for the first time. It's almost like you, you, you're sitting for gold every day. So he will have been excited by Springsteen, and he will have got it. What he actually did was, was create his own future. So there's the sense that suddenly John Lando has a future, away from being the miserable existence of a rock critic, which is an, a, an awful cul-de-sac. My first impressions of him from seeing him live and getting to know him in 1974 were that uh, he, was, he was a genius. And uh, that's not something you 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 lose you know and uh, he's the same guy uh that i knew then today i think he's better than ever and uh he's an incredible person that inner core of of talent and perception about the world around him it's just he brings it with him it's just wherever he came from he brings it with him so uh landau's partnership with bruce led to the exciting creation of a sound that would stamp Springsteen's musical genius all over the world with Born to Run. That was the, one of the few records I've ever made where after we mixed it, I came home I put it on the next morning and said, that's exactly what I want it to sound like. He, at this point, really started to show his perfectionism. He spent 14 months recording this and six months alone on the single Born to Run. And he was tremendously frustrated. He is pacing about the studio and he's angry. He's like a little ball of tension. And he's scrawling lyric after lyric after lyric in his notebook and trying to communicate to his band why the sounds they're playing aren't good enough and why they aren't what, what are in his head. He went through all this torment with himself because he'll have been listening to it and thinking, well, that doesn't really, really sound like me. What would my mates or the people that I grew up with in, you know, New Jersey think of that? And then he brought in Steve Van Zandt and almost like Steve Van Zandt was to say, well, look, Bruce, this is a great song. This is a great sound. And he'll have needed that. You know, because, it, you know, really, you know, part of the sensitivity, part of what makes him special is kind of that self-doubt and that lack of self-confidence. The, the process we used then was quite similar to the process we use now, except 
uh, not anywhere near as painful. <laughs> you know, uh, it was, uh, we were just learning to make records, and so uh, the records were long and they were hard and we didn't really know what we were doing. And we were also trying to build a core philosophy around what our band was going to be and what we wanted to talk about. And, and, and uh, so it was really, it was a very shaping album. It had to be amazing. It had to be amazing. And therefore, it had to sound amazing because all rock music really is its sound. He was still massively frustrated uh, and legendarily threw the entire recording into an alley and said that he would rather cut this album live at the bottom line, which is a dingy club that they used to play at, um, than, than go back into a recording studio and have that frustration of not being able to perfect that sound. Those seven or eight people or nine people or something where just such a, a big part of my life at this point that... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've lived my life, I've lived a lifetime with them, you know, probably several lifetimes <laughs> already. So it's, it's, it's always great to have everybody alongside me at night. But just when many thought Bruce Springsteen's glory days were over, he bounced back with an astounding vengeance with one of the most exciting rock albums in music history, Born in the USA. One of the big hits from, from Born in the USA was Dancing in the Dark, and it has a, a quite legendary video, which shows, shows Bruce playing live, and he picks a girl out of the, um, of the audience to dance with her on stage. And, and people, I think, at the time thought, maybe it's a genuine footage. It wasn't. The girl in, in the audience was an actress. In fact, she was Courtney Cox, who would go on to be a huge star in, in Friends. And, and probably that video really started her career. Come on in the morning. Go to bed feeling the same way. Can't start a fire. Worry about your little world falling apart. There's guns for hire. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. There's guns for hire. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. Nineteen eighty five was to prove an astonishing year for Bruce. Not only did he assert himself as one of the biggest rock stars of all time, but he also met his future wife, actress Julianne Phillips, and married her soon after. It was a very short-lived marriage and, and quite an unhappy one, by all accounts. Um, it would go on to create the album Tunnel of Love, which was radically different to a lot of the bombastic songs that he'd been recording before. It, he seems very vulnerable, a little broken, and it's really one of the classic breakup albums of all time. When you're in love with someone and you're married to someone, you, you know, and especially with him coming from that kind of Catholic background, no divorce, Love is forever, you've made that commitment. That will have tortured him too. There's a, a track called Brilliant Disguise in which there's a lyric which goes, well, I've tried so hard, baby, but I just can't see what a woman like you is doing with a man like me. And I think that pretty much sums it up. But it wasn't long before his broken heart started to mend. He began dating one of his backing singers, Patty Schialfa, whom he had also romanced prior to his marriage with Phillips. For the first time in his career, Bruce had to endure serious criticism in the press. Not about his music, but about the hastiness in which he and Patty had started their romance. Not long after, he and Julianne divorced on March 1st, 1989. Patty seems to be one half of a great partnership with Bruce. They, they seem to rely on each other a great deal. I think creatively as, as well as personally, along with talking about Jersey, he will always talk about Patty on stage, particularly if she's not there. You know, some people say opposites attract, and, and for me, I just, I couldn't function like that. I, I like to feel very close to somebody and know their whole, feel like I know their whole internal landscape and, and, and that they would know mine in return. So that you're both in the same business, we end up working together, but, but um, I just find it really helpful because you really understand what the person needs and 
They understand what you need. And see, my parents worked together, so it was natural to me to be in a house where people had very similar paths. I like that. You know, Bruce and I, we grew up 10 miles from each other, so we have all the same, you know, in, in our minds, the old picture files are, are the same. You know, the, the, it's nice to have a lot in common, I think that it just really helps you in that distance of that you feel like very kindred. When Bruce and I got together and, and to have a strong marriage and have a beautiful family and three children, they're healthy, it's so blessed. It, it just really is. And I, that's my priority because for me, it, it's, it's beautifully stable and warm. And of course you have all the problems, you know, the same, those kind of problems, but but in the long run, I've never felt better in, in my entire life. Emotionally, I've never felt emotionally better. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Good. It's uh, surreal. <laughs> <laughs> All evening. <laughs> in 1994, Bruce won the Oscar for Best Song for Streets of Philadelphia. It was the soundtrack of the highly acclaimed movie Philadelphia starring Tom Hanks as a struggling HIV patient. On March 1st, 1995, he won four Grammys, and in 1996, he was Oscar-nominated for Dead Man Walking for the film of the same name. But in 1998, he found himself waging war in a London court against a company which had released some of his early 1970s recordings without his permission. They eventually settled out of court with Springsteen gaining back the rights to his work. Because, well, the way, that, the way that you release and the songs that you release is the way that you shape your work. It's the way that you shape your career and, 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 and who you are, you know. It's uh, one of the most important things to a songwriter in the world, you know. It's something I've fought for since I was very young, you know, was the uh, control and, and, uh, of my music. You know, it's still a really important issue for me, so I'm glad that I came and I do it again. He is respected by his peers, um, Sting, Bono, um, you know, authorities on music, Grail Marcus, people like that, they adore Bruce. He is an intelligent but personable musician who is also a genius. I heard they gave you, I heard they gave you a standing ovation yesterday in rehearsal, Bruce. Oh yeah, but I think all those people were paid to be there, so I'm not sure if it counts. After 9-11, I was working for one of the TV news programs here, and I had to fly to the States. And then having reported from New York, I then went to New Jersey. And I met there a woman whose firefighter husband had been in one of the Twin Towers and who hadn't come back. It was an incredibly powerful interview because she said to me, I'll never forget it, that she he left a note for her that day just to say, and this is just a normal day, my love, I love you so much. You changed my whole life. I live for you and I can't wait to come home and, you know, stay safe. And it was him that died. And I remember being so affected by just how much had been ripped away that day. And then just as we were chatting after the interview, she said, oh, I got a call from uh, Bruce Springsteen. And I said, oh, that's amazing because, of course, he's from around here. You know, I always wonder whether he's still connected with New Jersey and still cares about it. And she said, yeah, hugely. She said he'd been ringing up the the widows of firefighters and you know he, she loved his music and he was local and he was a real child of New Jersey but more than that he'd he'd rung up the widows of the firefighters to speak to them at length about what they were going through and you know to try and give them some comfort and I found that incredibly powerful I mean it actually sort of reinforced to me the fact that that what I feel I hear in Springsteen's music is something very very authentic about blue collar New Jersey and that he's still very much locked into that world. No one really understood what had happened or what could happen. And so I think I was sitting down to just sort of, okay, well, what do I do now? You know, what, what do you say now? How has your dialogue with your audience changed? What, what do they need? What do you need to say? He ended up talking to their families, and a lot of that ended up inspiring kind of uh, that record. And again, you know, that's that's 
he's he's doing research, you know, he, he's collecting oral histories, he's doing what Woody Guthrie did, you know, he's, he's hearing the stories firsthand, and that's, I think, what makes him a great songwriter, he's doing research. And he was back on form, and he's back to what he does. He, he, you know, there's that directness about it, you know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't shirk the issues, because, again, there's a part of Springsteen that goes back to New Jersey and where he came from, and that Catholic thing, he wants to put something back. And I don't mean financially, I mean emotionally. You know, because otherwise, what's it all about? It's not just about being a pop star. Do you think it's your duty as, as a famous musician, as a lyricist, as a, 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 a kind of guardian of the American soul to get involved politically? Um, not necessarily, you know. I think that I've had a voice that's spanned over a period of 40 years now. People generally know where I'm coming from and uh, my point of view. Uh, I believe that if you, if you get out there on the stump, which I've done a few times, um, I think it's nice to show some support, but I, I, I don't necessarily believe that musicians turn the tide or, or have any deep, deep political influence uh, in that sense. He's very careful, I think, not to get too involved in party politics. That's not to say that his, his songs aren't very political with a small p, and, and The Rising was clearly a song about, in some way, reaffirming the American soul after it had taken such a, a beating on 9-11. Um, but I think he's somebody who stays above the fray. He's very... Because his, his words can, can move people, and he doesn't, he doesn't speak as much as he could in the political world is quite interesting. I think he, he's got a sense of his own importance, actually. When Obama had won, um, his song, The Rising, was the first song played, apparently, um, after the announcement, after Obama's speech, and uh, again, I think, after his inauguration. That wonderful flowering he had under Obama, when suddenly he sees the better side of America, the, the side of America that, that, that really wants to do good things, that still believes in this innocent sense of the American dream. And in his 60s, he still has the American dream and, and the reformation of, of the E Street Band. And suddenly he's not on his own, playing lonely, melancholy songs about the breakdown of a society and the breakdown of a dream. He's suddenly up again. He's lifted himself up again. He's got this incredible power again. He's with his mates. We're all in it together. We're out again. We're going we're gonna to conquer some more territory. We're going to do a bit more plundering. And that's what I love about Bruce. That same year, he received a Golden Globe for Best Song in a Movie for Mickey Rourke's The Wrestler. After receiving a heartfelt plea from Rourke, Springsteen supplied the song for free. I was just so glad when Bruce got it for The Wrestler because, you know, I wrote him a letter and he wrote the song for me and, you know, that would have been enough for me tonight. And what of the E Street Band now? Sadly, Danny Federici has died now, um, but he was uh, a very talented man and played everything from the accordion to God knows what else, everything. <laughs> um, Max is the band leader for the uh, Conan O'Brien show. His son, Phil, Jay, has filled in on tour for Bruce, uh, so he hasn't had to give up his day job. And uh, Steve Van Zandt appears in The Sopranos, which uh, is all quite extraordinary, but they all come back together to support Bruce. Clarence Clemens is, is an extraordinary figure in, um, in Bruce's band and on his records. He couldn't be... Nobody else could fill that role, and Bruce obviously loves him with a fiery passion. Um, musically, he brings something that I think could only really belong in a, in a blue-collar town, this kind of ritziness. It dresses up a song like it's going out on the town, you know, it gives a bit of razzle-dazzle. You know, there have been times they've thought about leaving him off a record, but then he comes back in and he makes it, he makes that E Street sound. When we went on stage to play, we were playing for each other. 
you know, we had to live up to the, uh, the expectations of each other as a group, the band, and to, to turn each other on, to keep each other going, you know, and, and there's thousands of people just like peeking through a peek, a peek hole at what's happening, uh, these guys having a great time on stage. And so that's how it's always been with, uh, with the E Street Band. We've just been having a great time ourselves, and we invite others to look in, you know, to, because if we play to the best of our own capacities, then that, that's, that's sufficient, you know? That's, that's what it's all about, yeah. I think what's happened is they're very, it's, it's very visible right now because the past 40 years, as the deindustrialization and globalization has affected a lot of work lives, the issues that, that matter to uh, a lot of hardworking folks have, haven't been addressed. You know, it's like this, if I couldn't be a musician tomorrow and I had to find something else to mm -hmm. do, I have no idea what I'd do. I'd be at a loss. So your steel mill closes down, your factory moves, moves south or moves overseas. Um, that's your life walking away from you, you know? So uh, it's really a moment where their concerns have come to the front. Of course, it usually only happens when someone wants your vote, sure. but uh, it has happened. And so they're, you know, I think they're demanding a response of some sort and neither party has has really addressed their concerns. I mean, the, the landscapes that you write about in your lyrics, and I've traveled to a lot of these places in America myself, I think they're heartbreaking. I mean, these are heartbreaking landscapes of kind of urban desolation and despair and abandonment. And a lot of the people that I speak to on these trips, they love Donald Trump. They love him because they think that he is finally hearing them. Do you get that in your, in, the, in your community? I mean, the people that you used to know in New Jersey as well? Can you understand where that's coming from? I mean, I, I know some Trump voters, you know, but um, I think that he's really, he's really preyed upon that part of, part of, part of the country because he gives these very glib and superficial answers to very, very entrenched and very difficult problems. But there are answers that sound pretty good if you've struggled for the past 20 or 30 years. So... Um, you can understand his appeal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can understand that there's somebody with simple answers to very complicated questions who sound like they're listening to you for the first time. Do you think the people who like him are racists? No, no. I, I, don't, I don't believe that uh, you can't generalize like that. You know, I think, I think there's all kinds of people that are interested in, in him for, for, for a variety of different reasons. But in a way, those, I mean, America's built, that part of America's been looking for someone to come and talk to them for a very long time. You did it with your music, and uh, you write about that very eloquently in your book. Yeah. But politically, they've been left behind, haven't they? I believe so, yes. Are the Democrats the answer this time? Is Hillary Clinton the answer? I don't know. You know, I don't really know. Um, I think Bernie Sanders had, had some appeal, you know. Um, but I'm not sure if there's anybody out there who really is going to dig into those problems. Because I saw you uh, playing with Barack Obama in Madison, Wisconsin. I think it was his last rally in the last election in 2012. Massive crowd. Are um, you going to play for Hillary Clinton this time around? Mm, I don't have any plans at the moment. You know, it's only three weeks left in the election. And uh, Has she asked you? Mm, no, they've been in contact to use a piece of music or something, which which is is fine by me. I think she, she, I think she'll be a good president. You know, I don't hear undiluted enthusiasm. You know, <laughs> but um, um, but you're not going to be playing for Trump. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bruce Springsteen has won 20 Grammys, two Golden Globes, and an Academy Award. And he sold over 120 million albums worldwide. Bruce has said that he spent much of his life as a musician measuring the distance between the American dream and the reality. To me, that quote completely sums Springsteen up, because it's true, he's come from a, a working class New Jersey background and he's made it, he's fulfilled the dream. But I don't think he's even noticed. He's actually really looking at all the people who 
who haven't made it, who haven't got what they dreamt of, and he's feeling like he had no right to dream of it himself in the first place. And it is always that sense, you know, the, the, the Chevrolet is hurtling down Thunder Road, but where's it going to? You know, it's, it's going to end as a, a burnt out wreck. And it's all the, the passengers, you know, Wendy and Born to Run, and the sadness of, of her realizing as well that they, they weren't going to get anywhere. And I think. I just, it's so powerful. It is such an American thing as well. It's, it's because I think the Americans dream bigger. To me, Springsteen's just one of those people I will always be interested. What's he going to come up with next? I think he's aware of the fact that the American dream isn't necessarily that you get whatever you want. He didn't give up. He, he like suffered through like, you know, a legion of hardships. You know, there were doubt and heartache and all these things. And he, they're wrapped up in his person. He has in many ways achieved the American dream, playing rock and roll and a great American invention. However, he misses, I should imagine, certainly his songs would suggest the life of the ordinary man with the porch and the girl dancing and the radio playing. There is that chance that his best song might still come. And I think there's very few artists that you can say that about, and that's what makes him so rare and so special. I've been doing it for 30 years. I'm going to continue to do it, mainly because I like it. <laughs> it's fun for me. I hope it provides lots of other things, you know. Uh, we try to be dutiful about it. We try to be professionals about it. I believe in the band as a professional unit. When you buy your ticket, our handshake is our word. We're going to come out. When you come on that night, we're going to be the greatest band we can be, you know? We work real hard to provide that consistently every night. Looking ahead, you know, you've done so much. What else are you going to do? What, what's your, what, are your, what are the things you haven't done there? What's on your bucket list? My thing is I just keep doing the same old thing, you know? I mean, I work, I put my records out. Um, I continue to talk about the things that I'm interested in. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, those are the, uh, that's the way I approach my job. You so know? You've, I take it day to day. You've written this, this great book. So obviously now you're going to get the Nobel Prize for Literature, like <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you wrote it, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Not just not just for your lyrics, but also for you know for a real book. <laughs> the Boss, Bruce Springsteen, one of the greatest performers ever to grace the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and one of the brightest stars that will continue to shine for generations. Let me find it. There. Okay. All right. I have a uh, favorite place I go. I go to it was a favorite spot that my pop used to go to. It was a place called the Manasquan Inlet, and um, it's just a place. Yeah, it's just a place where the boats come in and the boats go out by the beach. Lovely set of rocks. So this is me traveling home from a short visit at the Manasquan Inlet. I travel into a stream of headlights as commuter cars holding their day travelers flash by inches from my left handle grip. I move north up the highway until the traffic recedes, leaving only my headlight illuminating blank road and dashes of white line, white line, white line, white line. My ape hanger, high rise handlebars, thrust my arms out in skyward shoulder height opening me up to the wind's full force. It's a rough embrace. As my gloved hands tighten their grip on that new evening sky, the cosmos begins to flicker to life in the twilight above me. With no fairing, a 60 mile per hour gale steadily pounds into my chest, nudging me to the back of my seat, subtly threatening to blow me off 600 pounds of speeding steel, reminding me of how the next moment holds no guarantees and of how good things are. This day, this life, how lucky I've been, how lucky I am. I turn the corner off the highway onto a dark country road. I hit my high beams. I scan the flat farm fields looking for deer, all clear. I twist the throttle as rushing into my arms comes home. Come home in the morning, 
Go to bed feeling the same way. Can't start a fire. Worrying about your little world falling apart. There's guns for hire. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. Even if we're just dancing